Welcome to Ryan's Running Reviews. For this video, Roadrunner Sports has partnered with both Hoka and Saucony to go over some of their very popular Super Race Day shoes and Tempo Daily Trainers. Let's run with it. To start things off, we'll take a look at the Hoka shoes first. We have the brand new Cielo X1. This is a carbon fiber plated race day shoe intended for the half or full marathon. Next, we have the Mach X. This has a PBAX or plastic plate in it, which is a tempo daily trainer or potential race day shoe for some runners. And then finally, we have the completely redesigned Mach 6. This is one of Hoka's lightest training shoes and is quite good for those faster training runs as well. With regard to the pricing, the Cielo X1 is $275, the Mach X is $180, and then finally we have the Mach 6 at $140. Hoka is known for their large midsoles with maybe the exception of the Mach series. Yes, I know the Mach 6 did get a little bit bigger this year, but I think it still remains Hoka's light, fast, and nimble option. Now with regard to stack height for the Mach 6, we have 37 in the heel, 32 in the forefoot for a five millimeter drop. The Mach X has 39 in the heel and 34 in the forefoot for that same five millimeter drop. And the Cielo is gonna be a little bit different where you have 39 in the heel and 32 in the forefoot for a seven millimeter drop. Most Hoka's have a five millimeter drop. The Cielo with its seven millimeter, seven millimeter drop I think is due to its unique geometry, which we will touch on later. For US men's size 10, the Mach 6 weighs 8.2 ounces, while the Mach X comes in at 9.4. And then finally, the Cielo X1 is actually somewhat heavy for its super shoe race day category, coming in at 9.3 ounces. The upper material on both the Mach 6 and the Mach X is fairly similar. It's a Creole Jacquard mesh, really thin and breathable, has good airflow. However, the fit of these two shoes is very different. On the Mach 6, it's gonna be really narrow. So if you have a higher volume foot, I maybe recommend going up half a size are going with a different option. The Mach 6 does fit true size and while it isn't the most voluminous upper ever, I thought it was quite comfortable and nowhere near as narrow compared to the Mach 6. The tongue on both the Mach 6 and Mach X are gusseted. However, I really like what they did on the Mach X. They added a foam block towards the top to give you some lace pressure protection. While on the Mach 6, they gave you some plastic overlays, which do get the job done, but I do prefer that additional foam block we have on the Mach X tongue. The heel counters are both fairly strict and do a good job, and the lockdown, I think, on both of these options is quite superb, but like I mentioned before, it is going to be a little bit narrow on the Mach 6 with regard to the fit. The Cielo X1 is kind of its own unique thing here with the upper. It's an engineered knit material. It's not elastic at all, has no give to it. And in between these large vertical lines is a little bit of stitching or mesh, which gives you a great deal of breathability. I think it works really well with regard to that. The tongue has a lot of stretch and give to it. It's a knit material and has a pull tab at the top, which is helpful because getting your foot into the shoe is a bit difficult. The heel counter has a lot of play to it and give. There are two small foam blocks on the inside to give you some additional padding. I think they do a decent job. The one gripe I have with this upper, just the overall lockdown and fit, is the lacing system. The laces have to go through two lacing slots compared to the, just the typical one you see on most running shoes. And this setup gives you a little bit of difficulty when it comes to getting everything aligned properly. So when you get your foot into the shoe and then you try to adjust the laces, it takes a good bit of effort compared to your conventional lacing setup. I thought the lockdown was good, could be better. Maybe a stronger heel counter would work in the more traditional lacing setup. But otherwise, I think it gets the job done. And I think this uh, engineered knit material looks fairly cool. When it comes to the midsoles, each of these shoes is drastically different. They each have a different kind of setup, a different kind of foam, and just a different implementation altogether. The Mach 6 has been completely redesigned. There's no plate or anything like that in this shoe. And if you remember previous versions of the Mach series, you would have a really soft, bouncy foam on top and then a firmer rubberized foam on the bottom. And that's been completely changed here. It's now pretty much all that soft, bouncy foam throughout the midsole. It's a super critical, EVA foam, which is going to be a little bit softer, has a little bit more energy return compared to the compression molded EVA foam we see on the very popular Hoka Clifton 9. I think the Mach 6 works really well for those looking for a fast paced, non-plated, neutral trainer that's fairly nimble for a Hoka shoe. They also gave us full rubber coverage on the outsole, which was not the case on prior versions of the Mach, which should help the overall longevity. It also helps stiffen up the forefoot and helps you take advantage of that classic Hoka rocker geometry. 
The Mach X has two different kinds of foam in the midsole with a full length PBAX or plastic plate in between those two layers. The top layer is going to be a PIBA foam. It's even softer and bouncier compared to the supercritical EVA we see in the Mach 6. And then the bottom layer is going to be compression molded EVA foam, which is going to be firmer and more stable. Now, I personally really like the Mach X. I liked it so much, I used it while support running for one of my Ultra Runner friends in the Badwater 135, which is why this shoe looks so dirty. Now, this also works at slower paces, and I think it works really well if you want to push it all the way to race day. This kind of sits in between the super shoe category and the daily training category. I think it bridges the gap fairly well. I really do enjoy the implementation of Piva foam, but then you have the stability of the compression molded EVA foam underneath and the plastic plate really does a great job of helping you notice that rocker geometry and kind of pushes you along. Now this isn't the lightest super shoe and it is fairly heavy for a race day shoe, but I think the overall performance is quite comfortable and I think it does a solid job at a wide range of runs. And then finally, we have the super unique Cielo X1. Now, what makes this shoe special? Well, it's a couple different things. The first thing is the entire midsole is made out of that super soft and bouncy Piba foam, the same kind we see on the top layer of the Mach X. And then to stabilize that really soft and bouncy Piba material, we have a full length winged carbon fiber plate. So you can see the stability wings popping out here on the lateral side, the top of the forefoot, and then again here on the medial side. This carbon fiber plate is incredibly stiff and rigid. It keeps the shoe from bending or twisting. It's much, much more aggressive compared to the plastic or p plate we see in the Mach X. And then finally, we have an incredibly aggressive rocker geometry. This is one of the craziest rockers I have seen in a running shoe in some time. So the curvature of this shoe just really rolls you forward much faster compared to those other race day shoes out there. So when you combine all those factors together, this shoe feels just kind of like on its own world. It's a completely unique running experience. I think that's why so many people have been kind of drawn to this. Now, the downsides are this shoe, in my opinion, doesn't really work well at those slower paces, and it's a bit heavy to be considered like one of the top elite tier super race day shoes, but I think it kind of nestles into that fast and fun category that works really well for some runners looking for just a ton of stack and a really aggressive and fast rocker. Well, that does it for the Hoka shoes. It's time to take a look at the Sockney options. And here they are. And while these shoes may look similar, I can assure you they are very different. We have the Endorphin Pro 4. This is Saucony's carbon fiber plated super race day shoe. And then we also have the Endorphin Speed 4, which is a nylon plated or plastic plated super trainer designed for those faster workouts or even race day for some runners. There's some key differences here, which I'm excited to talk about. The Pro 4 costs $225, while the Speed 4 costs $170. However, the Pro is going to be significantly lighter at 7.5 ounces for a US men's size 9, which is pretty good for a race day shoe. And then the Speed 4 for a US men's size 9 is going to be 8.2 ounces, which again is pretty good for this kind of super trainer slash potential race day category. With regard to stack height, the Pro 4 has 39.5 in the heel and 31.5 in the forefoot for an 8mm drop, while the Speed has 36 in the heel and 28 in the forefoot for that same 8mm drop. So you need a little bit more midsole here with the Pro. Both shoes do fit true to size. However, the upper on the Speed 4 is going to have a bit more space to it. It's more like a training upper, uh, just a little bit more volume overall compared to the Pro 4 upper, which has a race day like fit, which makes sense because this is a racing shoe. It's going to be slightly more narrow, and that kind of appears to be very obvious when you compare the inserts. The insert on the Pro 4 is not removable, while it is removable on the Speed 4. Now, the insert is actually made of something called a super responsive material, which is what Saucony brands it as. So it's not your typical insert, it's a slightly more dense and bouncy kind of foam material. The same kind of special foam insert does exist on the Pro 4, however, the insert is not removable and much more narrow and thin. The tongue on the Pro 4 is a really stretchy and elastic knit material, which is integrated directly into the upper itself, which means it's all one piece. Now, this could be a good or bad thing depending on the shape of your foot. 
If you have to pull those laces tight, you might get some bunching and there's not much lace pressure protection. It worked fine for me, but I do typically prefer a more traditional tongue like we see on the Speed 4. You have a little bit of padding at the top and then a really thin kind of engineered mesh tongue all the way down, which is in fact gusseted. So it kind of depends on what you're going for. We have the one piece construction on the Pro and then the more traditional setup on the Speed. The upper material on the Pro 4 is a super intricate and open mesh, incredibly thin. You have these plastic overlays that give the upper some support. The heel counter is fairly flexible, not much there, kind of a spine that goes up the back that gives you a little bit of rigidity, and I thought the lockdown was pretty good. On the Speed, we have a slightly more traditional kind of fabric engineered mesh, if you will. It has large holes, ventilation is great, just not as good compared to the Pro. The heel counter has a little bit more rigidity to it and is not as aggressive compared to what we saw last year on the Speed 3. I know some people had some issues with that, but I thought the lockdown was pretty good. No major complaints and you do have a moderate amount of padding in the ankle and Achilles section. The midsole on the Pro 4 has been completely redesigned. It's Power Run PB on the outside with Power Run H on the inside and a full length carbon fiber plate which stiffens up things and helps you notice the rocker. You can also see the carbon fiber plate in this little cutout here. Now you're probably wondering what is the difference between the outer Power Run PB and internal core of Power Run HG. Well Power Run PB is what has been historically used on the Pro model. It's a really bouncy beaded PBAX material. It's also used on the, uh, the, the Speed 4. But Power Run HG is a super critical PIBA material, which means it's going to be lighter and has more energy returns. So when you pair these together, you get a really energetic ride. But for me, it only starts to come alive when you push the pace. It's not ideal at those slower to moderate paces, which kind of makes sense for a race day shoe. The midsole on the Speed 4, however, is all Power Run PB. It's just the same kind of material with a full length nylon or plastic plate that has stability wings on both the lateral and medial side to help kind of give some guidance and support to the super bouncy uh, Power Run PB foam. Now this plate helps stiffen up the midsole too. It's nowhere near as aggressive and snappy compared to the carbon plate we see in the Pro, but it does make a noticeable difference in helping the shoe become fast and somewhat versatile. I think it does a decent job at those slow to moderate paces, but it also works quite effectively when you push it to race pace as well. Now the thing here with this shoe is it's also kind of like a moderately cushioned option with all the other kind of super shoes and training options getting thicker and thicker. It has a few less millimeters of stack height compared to the Pro, and that is noticeable, but I do think this still continues to be a solid, kind of quick and versatile daily trainer. Well, that concludes the overview. I hope this video gives you a better understanding of Hoka and Saucony's race day shoes and tempo daily trainers, because I know there's a lot of running shoes out there and it can be somewhat confusing. Well, I'm Ryan from Ryan's Running Reviews, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Thanks.